Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on Winsight Live. You know, it was three years ago, uh, part, yeah, three years ago this month that Kroger announced its restock strategy, a comprehensive strategy to kind of reset the business for the coming digital revolution. Um, and this morning, Kroger CEO Roddy McMullen, along with the CFO Gary Millerchip, gave a little bit of an update, not as good an update as you're going to get in March, where they've rescheduled its uh, usual investor conference from the fall to the spring, they say due to uh, coronavirus, when they everybody can meet, uh, hopefully everybody can meet in person next year. But a little bit of an update on sort of how, uh, you know, this, this expensive and uh, ambitious program went for Kroger. Um, and for analysts listening in, it was really kind of a challenge of sort of separating, you know, how much of this is, is restock and how much of this is coronavirus that has kind of led to Kroger's better uh, performances. Just a couple of, uh, you know, notes I'd share from this and, and uh, you know, to let our, our, our viewers know, we'll have a full story on this shortly at Winside Grocery Business. Uh, but, uh, you know, the seamless ecosystem, which they're talking about now available for 98% of its shoppers, um, you know, that means pickup and delivery, uh, those kinds of things. Now, you know, when they started this, I think the pickup was in, and don't quote me on this, uh, close to 800 stores. Now it's close to 2,600. Um, you know, they, they announced any number of uh, partnerships with companies from, uh, you know, Ocado, uh, to uh, robotic uh, fulfillment uh, vehicles from Neuro and um, acquisition of things like Home Chef. And so, um, you know, they're at an interesting point right now. Again, the details, further details are going to come um, and, and maybe a succeeding strategy to restock such as it is will come uh, early next year in March. But that's an update from Kroger Film. So, John, you know, I'm wondering if, if I'm looking at this race uh, for technology and for innovation, um, I, I put the there's probably three leaders in it. One is Walmart, obviously, but they're pretty closed mouth. Uh, the other one uh, being uh, Kroger. And then Albertsons, you know, we, we haven't really heard a lot um, since the IPO about all the kind of innovation that they're doing and so on. But behind the scenes, I'm hearing that they're doing some dramatic things. Uh, they, they stole a bunch of uh, tech and really smart people away from Walmart. Um, who do you think is going to win this? Um, is it going to be Kroger or Albertsons or Walmart? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not cheating here, but I want to say a combination of them. And, you know, they, you know, it's it's a question of somebody else being the losers. And, you know, to that, I'd include companies like Publix and, and you know, uh, Ajo Delhaize and, and, and all these guys. I mean, listen, you know, what Kroger did was uh, restock. They kind of admitted, you know, where, where we're putting our energies these last, you know, 15 years, which, you know, how successful they were. You know, we needed to do more. Um, you know, Albertsons has done the same thing. They didn't give it a, a, a name like that, but you're right. They, they've done a, a quite a bit in terms of, uh, you know, acquiring talent, uh, you know, Microsoft people, Amazon people, uh, you mentioned Walmart people uh, coming in there. And, and you know, they're, they're sort of doing a lot of the same things, so to speak, really Ajo Delis too. You mm -hmm. know, there's, there's degrees of differences between them, but I mean, all of them are saying, you know, the, the, the shopper of the future is going to do a percentage of the shopping in stores and a percentage of the shopping online. And, you know, to use Rodney McMullen's words from this morning, you know, we want it to get to a point at which we're going to be indifferent to what they're going to, you know, the modality that they're going to shop. And for Kroger and, and all these guys, the challenge is, is to make, you know, every form of shopping as profitable as people walking into the store. And so, you know, that takes this combination of, of massive cost cuts, which, you know, restock has, uh, yeah. you know, productivity initiatives, process changes, you know, um, and just like physically doing things to stores, adding pickup areas. And, and of course, for Kroger, adding, you know, 20 massive robotic uh, fulfillment centers at $50 million a pop. Um, you know, that is coming next spring, which is part of, I think, the reason that, that Kroger is kind of uh, being a little coy with the details on, uh, you know, what things are going to look like in the future. 
Uh, we're also going to get an update on what's going on with, with Walgreens. You know, I've been kind of watching that for a long time. You know, uh, that could be a very interesting um, uh, developments there in terms of a, a partnership. They've got a buying partnership now. They've got some stores that are working together to do pickup and, and grocery departments inside. And, um, uh, you know, there, there's fulfillment um, uh, needs for grocery shoppers in markets where Kroger is going to be building these fulfillment centers that they haven't really, you know, established yet. And, and you got to think that Walgreens would play a role in that too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's probably the most exciting time um, in in grocery that we've seen, you know, probably probably forever. Uh, so a couple things to get us started. Um, first of all, this comes from the Christmas tree promotion board. I didn't even know that there was a Christmas tree promotion board, uh, but they just did a survey. Uh, True Global Intelligence fielded a survey of over 2000 adults. And what they're saying this year is people want to make their home a more pleasant place, 84%, and emotionally they want to make Christmas more memorable, 82%, make it the best Christmas for their kids ever, 78%. Um, and you know what, what this all translates to is they're saying there's going to be a lot more fresh Christmas trees being sold this year because of, of the pandemic. People just want, you know, to, for home to be, you know, that much more safe and so on. They've also put up a website. It's christmaskeepitreal.com where you can see in your neighborhood, in your zip code, who's selling free Christmas trees. Um, also from Food and Wine, uh, foodandwine.com has this great report out uh, this morning. And it turns out that just like we have a seed vault um, in Norway, we now have a global Oreo vault. And this is true. This is not a joke. Uh, so, so the folks at Oreo, and they put up a whole bunch of, of YouTube videos about it, um, have, have uh, the, the secret Oreo recipe, a large stockpile of cookies. And as an added precaution, the Oreo packs are wrapped in mylar, which can withstand temperatures from minus 80 degrees to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's impervious to chemical reactions, moisture, and air, keeping the cookies fresh and protected for years to come and i thought it was just twinkies that could last for years but now i guess we have oreos as well to, to do that uh pat uh, talk to us about the, this whole new uh reinvention if you would of secret menus i mean i'm here in california in and out burgers had their secret menu for years but what you've written about is that how restaurants now uh, are are really using secret menus as a way to add excitement and uh, and stimulate business. Right. So they're using digital a lot to alert people that they have these secret menus. So they're not super secret, but you have to kind of be in the right social platform in order to know about them. There's actually a Reddit group that has about a thousand members and it's all devoted to secret menus. So they spread the word, but we're, they're also using QR codes as a way for consumers to access the secret menus in the restaurant. So if you come into Lucille's restaurants in California, which is a 22 unit chain out there, uh, you can scan the QR code and you'll, it'll, what will come up is a menu for Chicken Shack, which is their secret menu. It's kind of a restaurant within the restaurant. And it has all the comfort food chicken dishes that people are craving now, like fried chicken sandwiches and fried chicken with gravy and things like that. And bar a little barbecue too, because that's what Lucille specializes in. So that's one way they're getting the word out about secret menus. So will it work? Well, I think people, you know, are ordering online too. So um, sweet green has a secret menu that's just online at one of its stores and you can only get it through Seamless. So it's kind of making people feel special and part of an exclusive club when right now people aren't feeling that special because of the pandemic. So it's just a way to kind of differentiate, get people engaged with your brand and um, try and win over some business. So talking about digital, uh, Jen, you wrote a piece about how digital is, is actually saving delis. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, the 
deli prepared food area really took a hit in the beginning of the pandemic and and retailers had to you know pivot and reinvent very quickly um, and so this is actually from our, our October November print issue which is now um, we're, we're starting to put those stories online so check out that content on our website um, and I talked to a number of retailers, Hy-Vee being one of them, and they launched their, their meals to go for curbside pickup back in April. And it just, of course, exploded with the pandemic. The demand was, you know, off the charts. So they, they needed reinforcements and, and partnered with DoorDash to, to expand that program of their fresh meals. And uh, I also interviewed uh, Sylvan Perrier from Mercatus um, for the piece. And he said, DoorDash is coming for Amazon and Instacart. So um, there's a, you know, a lot of competition in that third party space. I also spoke with um, the Fresh Grocer. Uh, they, um, they, sorry, the Fresh Market, they um, do an amazing array of, of meals, meal options, including like you know, an ultimate steak dinner for $149.99 for six people that you can order online and they're working with Instacart. And then Publix actually before the pandemic back in January started partnering with Instacart on a, on a digital deli. And, you know, their pub subs are so, they have such a loyal following for their pub subs. And as of July, they would sold enough of the, the pub subs. If you line them up to like cover over 750 football fields or something. So, so definitely the you know consumer is gravitating to that those digital options and, and curbside pickup and delivery for for the deli as they are for for groceries. So that's the deli, but what's going on with the salad bars? This you know I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this company Chowbotics. They have this yep. Sally the robot, very yep. cool. Um, it's such a small footprint. I mean it's it, it's like a three by three foot format. They can be in store, it could be, you know, on a, a, a colleges and universities and in healthcare facilities. And it's it's a, it's basically, you know, it looks like a vending machine and you you plug in what you want and it makes you this customizable salad, even if you want like extra dressing, they can accommodate that. And so Chowbotics just released an app now to make it even you know more contactless. So you can download the app as a consumer, find out where the nearest Sally the Robot is. And so in terms of retailers, there's, they have them in uh, Dorothy Lane, some Heinen's markets, um, Big Y. Um, and so you, you, you download a, that app, you, you put in what you, the salad that you want, and then you bring it in the, to the store and you scan the QR code at the Sally the Robot you know, vending area. And they, they're saying, Chobotics is saying that it's cutting down on order and dispensing of the salad by like 50%, the, the time it takes by like 50%. And also when you look at the waste factor, um, it's significant. And uh, we, we had done a story with Sally, um, I guess when it, when it was still in the prototype stage and I found it fascinating. So, so for those people who haven't seen it, again, go to Winsight Grocery Business and you can see a picture of Sally. Uh, but basically think in terms of tubes that contain different ingredients. So there's onions in this one and there's, um, you know, lettuce in this one and arugula in this one and so on. And you just can press all the buttons and make a customized salad and it comes out sealed uh, so you don't have to worry about anything um, from a from a contact standpoint I think it's I think it's brilliant um, and and unfortunately it took COVID-19 to to make it you know a very viable product uh, for supermarkets but I'm glad that supermarkets are embracing it um, hey Brett you know um, I'm hearing a lot about C stores and CBD what's going on there yeah Phil shifting gears here so uh Brief background, and I've probably spoken about CBD many times on this feed before, but over the past year and a half, two years-ish, um, CBD, which is cannabidiol, um, the non-psychoactive component of cannabis, um, it, this supplement is, or this ingredient is emerging in so many different types of products, and those products are hitting the C-Store space aggressively, um, whether it's tinctures, which are, you know, like little droplets you put under your tongue, uh, gummies. Um, packaged beverages, really, you name it, it it's hit in the space. Uh, and many retailers have already started to take these on. Uh, it's been more popular, I would say, in mid-sized to smaller chains, whereas the bigger chains uh, haven't 
taken as much of it on yet, even though some have, they haven't taken as much of it on just because the, the regulatory landscape is still kind of hazy with it. Uh, um, regulations vary f- from region to region across the country. So it's on these retailers to study their local laws and regulations and what they can and cannot do. Uh, that said, uh, news broke the other day and we just covered it on CSP that Circle K, the second largest convenience store in North America, um, they are bringing a, they partnered with a new uh, CBD company called Wild by Nature and they're bringing uh, CBD products to more than 150 stores in their Gulf Coast region. And so right now this is just in Florida and Alabama. So big news here, and this actually isn't the first time Circle K has done this. Earlier this year in March, they debuted CBD products with a different manufacturer in more than 400 of its stores in the coastal Carolinas region. Um, so big news, Circle K is obviously leading this charge, but other chains have, done, other bigger chains have done this as well. Um, but just because the CBD regulatory landscape is hazy, uh, anytime a big chain, especially one as large as Circle K does this, it's pretty newsworthy. I agree with you, and, and I'm very concerned about the regulations, and not only are there different regulations state by state, uh, but there really are no regulations about how much CBD to put into certain products. So you've really got to read those labels carefully, because uh, some of them have a lot of CBD in them, um, and that could be harmful for people who might be taking other medications, and certain CBD products have you know, practically nothing. They're just waving it over a vat. Uh, um, and, and you know, putting CBD on it. So I think that there's a lot of consumer confusion out there as well. And until that's cleared up, uh, I, I question whether or not CBD is going to be just a fad versus a trend, because certainly we see a lot of companies getting into it, um, probably more so in the uh, health and beauty aid arena than we are in the food arena. Uh, But, you know, I'm really concerned that the whole thing could, you know, blow up because of of all this confusion about how much CBD is actually in a certain product. So, so a big point here, Phil, to note is that, uh, so um, there's two components of of the cannabis plant. There's CBD and then there's THC, which THC is the popular one everyone knows they can try. So the whole point of of CBD products is, is that uh, they have uh, their, their um, percentage of THC is 0.4 or, or 0.04 or less. So if they don't break that 0.04 barrier, like it's considered a CBD product, uh, or some of them are considered CBD isolate, which means zero THC. So it's one of those two sectors. But again, uh, you know, consumer knowledge of this still needs to be improved. Um, right. Retailer knowledge of this needs to be improved. So it, it's a thing, but I do think though, you know, I don't think it's really just a fad. I mean, we've been talking about this nonstop for like two years now. Uh, if right. it was just a fad, I feel like it would be done. But the fact that it's still popping up, uh, I know with CSP, we're, we're speaking with new CBD companies all the time that are working with retailers. We still have our CBD forums that retailers attend to because they want to know how to properly sell this product uh, legally and marketing wise to their customers. So I think it's, I really do think it's here to stay. So John, you know, you, you wrote a report about how consumers are shifting. Um, you know, they've been very concerned about food safety, especially during COVID-19, but even, even before COVID-19. Food safety has always been one of the top concerns. Uh, we, we see, you know, just about every week, some lettuce product is being recalled or some chicken product is being recalled and so on. And, and you're writing that that's about to change. Well, to be clear, the, the, the headline is food safety to food prices. Uh, but I think what in, in this sense, uh, and, and this is a based on a report that came out from Dun Hunby, the data science company, uh, you know, this week, um, uh, the safety being, you know, kind of coronavirus, uh, shopping safety and your own health uh, going into a store. And so uh, just to back you up here, you know, Dun Hunby, since the very outset of the pandemic, has been doing a series of, of consumer surveys worldwide and uh developed this thing that they call the quote unquote worry index, which gets a, uh, um, uh, you know, it gets us, gives a sense of what consumers are concerned about, uh, given the extraordinary times that are facing us uh, during this pandemic. 
And, you know, as, as it's evolved over time, uh, this is the most recent update of this survey, the fifth one since uh, the very beginning of, uh, of April. And uh, what Dunhumby is saying is that consumers' concern about whether they're going to catch the coronavirus by going to a store is less than it was back in March or April. And, uh, but, you know, and then at that time, they were sort of indifferent to what they were paying for things because you, the way people were shopping for everything. And, you know, na naturally, and, and this is to be expected, um, people are getting a little bit more comfortable going out and shopping, uh, you know, whether they should or not is, is up to debate. But um, yeah. the, at the same time, they're becoming more and more price sensitive. And, and that just makes sense, right? Uh, you know, the economy is going uh, down. Uh, people are still out of work. There's not a whole lot of hiring going on in the world um, right now. And people are, you know, 49% uh, of U.S. consumers, according to the survey, uh, are reporting that, they're, that their own personal finance is in poor shape. Uh, that is up 20% since they asked that question wow. in July. 91% uh, of the shoppers, they said, are, are monitoring their prices very um, uh, carefully today. And, and that's up. So, uh, you know, Jose uh, Gomes at, at uh, Dunhumby, bright guy. I mean, he and I spoke, you know, way back in, in, you know, late March, I believe on this for the first time. And, you know, to the extent that he's clairvoyant or what have you, the, the uh, uh, he very much said, you know, let's not worry about, you know, the high prices today. Let's worry about what happens when consumers sort of absorb this environment we're in and really need to start saving money. And, and you know, so look, I think the, the, the big retailers kind of went with, uh, you know, the demand while they, while they had it. But I think that, you know, what this ought to tell retailers is that, you know, price sensitivity is going way up and, you know, the, the, the time at which people are gonna have to start, you know, duking it out on price again is, is coming very soon. And also, I saw a report out of the UK this morning. I'll probably get the numbers wrong, but the global economy is going to be 8.4% down um, over last year um, as a result of COVID-19 and, and everything else that's happening. Uh, so we've got the worry index. So, Jen, with that, you've got to give us some good news and wrap it up. Sure thing. Um so, you know, a lot of a lot of grocers do the, you know, the roundup for charity at, at checkout and, and Wegmans is, is one of those grocers and they've been doing it for a long time. They, this is their 27th year of their checkout wow. hunger campaign and, uh, you know, allowing shoppers to 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 make a donation or, or round up at, at the checkout and their first year 27 years ago, um, 1993 they raised uh, about $200,000 for local food banks. Um, they've now to date raised over 43 million and each year wow. they raise about 3.4 million for local food banks. So it's, it's nice to see a program like that growing exponentially. It is, and uh, a great, you know, great family, uh, both Danny and Colleen, and they put their heart and soul into everything. So uh, it is actually great news. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for joining us today uh, right here on Winsight Live. Uh, again, you can find our archives on CSP, Restaurant Business, Winsight Grocery Business, Supermarket Guru, both on the Facebook pages and on the websites. And we will see you on Thursday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and uh, don't forget, if you are going to vote by mail, you know, we've, we've heard the reports from Wisconsin this morning. Today's the day. If you want to make sure your vote is counted, make sure you mail it today. And when you're out there, wear a mask.